Hey guys, welcome back to another Rust tutorial. In this video, we'll be going over generics and traits. So traits are very similar to type classes in Haskell or interfaces in Java. It defines the behavior of a data type through methods and associate functions. To define a trait, we use the trait keyword. We can make the trait public for others to use with the pub keyword. And inside our trait, we define the methods and associate functions a data type needs to implement in order to satisfy this trait. So here, let's define a method that returns the sum of some value. All we need to do is write the method signature without any implementation. Now let's create a struct that implements our trait. To implement our trait, we use the info block followed by the trait that we want to implement and the struct that we want to implement for. Now let's initialize our struct and print out its sum. Now let's make this a little bit more complicated by creating another struct that implements our trait and creating a function that takes in a trait as a parameter. In our second struct, we'll have a size field. And for its sum method, we'll return its size. Now let's write a function that prints out the sum of a data type that implements our trait. To do this, our parameter will be of type impl my trait, indicating that it's a data type that implements our trait. And now we'll be able to call the sum function and we can see that everything is working correctly. Another thing that traits allows us to do is a default implementation. This is where we can add implementations to the methods or functions of our trait. Data type that implements our trait will automatically have this implementation by default, but they can override it by re-implementing it. So let's make our sum function return 10 by default and remove the implementation in our first struct. And if we run our code again, we see our code is still working the same. Okay, now let's move on to generics. Oftentimes we need to write the same code for different data types. Say we're sorting numbers or we're sorting strings. One solution to this is using polymorphism, like in Java or other object-oriented programming, but this usually has a runtime overhead. Another solution is using generics. Generics are a way for us to code without the use of concrete data types. Instead, we use placeholders that the compiler swaps out for concrete data types during compilation. So you can think of generic code as code that tells the compiler how to generate the same code but for different data types. We saw this before with the option enum that can take in any data type t. Now let's look at an example of how we can use generics to reduce the amount of code we need to write. So here we have two vectors, a vector full of integers and a vector full of characters. If we wanted to find the largest integer or the largest character in our vectors, we would need to create two separate functions for it. One that takes in a slice of integers and one that takes in a slice of characters. And as you can see, both of these functions work exactly the same. The only difference is the type of their parameter. We can use generics to make these two functions into a single function. To declare our generic, we use the angle brackets. Inside these angle brackets, we can define the placeholders that we want to use. So we'll define a generic type t. And now we can use this t type to replace our char or integer type. Now let's try compiling this and see what happens. We see that we get an error saying that our generic type T doesn't support the partial OR trait. This is because we didn't specify what our generic type is allowed to do. All we know that it's some data type, but we don't know what we can do with it. So we need to specify what we can do with this data type using traits. We specify the traits our generic type supports using the colon syntax. Now let's run our code again. And now we also need to add the copy trait to our generic type. To say that our generic type supports multiple traits, we use the plus operator. And now we can see our code is running like before, but now we've eliminated the use of two functions that do the same thing on different data types. One last thing is this syntax can get kind of messy. So Rust has another way for us to define the traits that our 
generic supports using the where keyword. One really cool thing I forgot to mention is that you can implement traits for data types that are not yours. Here I can implement my trait for the string data type from Rust's standard library. This is pretty handy when you find a library that does what you need, but you want its structs to be easier to work with in your code base. Now that we understand traits and generics, we can combine them to do some really cool things. The first thing we can do is have conditional impl blocks for specific generic types. So here we have a struct with two fields of generic type t. Now let's create an impl block to implement the new function for our struct. Now let's create another impl block, but this time it's only for generic type t that support the display trait. Let's write a method called print a b that prints out the values of a and b since we know they support the display trait. Now let's initialize two instances of our struct, one with a concrete type that supports the display trait and one that doesn't. And we see that when we try to compile it, we get an error saying m2 does not have the print a b method. Another thing we can do is something called a blanket implementation. This is where we can have an impl block for a generic type. So when you add functions and methods to this impl block, it will add it to all concrete types that fall under the generic type. So here we have our struct again with two fields of type integer, and it currently supports the display trait. Then we have our print value trait, which has a function called print value that takes in a self. Now let's make all data types that support the display trait support our print value trait as well. To do this, we write an impl block for a generic type t that supports the display trait. Then we simply implement our print value function. Now let's initialize two variables, one as our struct and one as a string, and we'll call the print value method for both of them. And we see our code ran successfully. And that's all for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I would really appreciate it if you hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And I'll see you guys in the next video.